<laughs> no, you wrong. People are animals, and aliens seem to be animals. So, should we expect animals on other planets? And with me here to discuss this issue is our animal expert, our biomarker expert, Jochen Brox. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so about 540 million years ago, there was something called the Cambrian Explosion. And somebody at a conference said, it's the Cambrian, it's the explosion of all life on Earth. And it's completely wrong, because Jochen had told me that it's not the explosion of animals, it's the explosion of, no, it's not the explosion of life, it's the explosion of, of animals. But more specifically, it's the explosion of our ability to detect animals in the fossil record, because that's when they first get it, got hard parts. So, uh, so Jochen, what exactly is the Cambrian explosion? And is it important for the issue of whether we should or should not expect animals on other planets? So, different people define the Cambrian explosion differently, but originally, really, the Cambrian explosion is really an explosion, an explosion of fossils in the geological record. If you look in rocks older than 540 million years, well, you find a few jellyfish-like, small, well, large creatures that were soft, and suddenly you get this explosion in the rock record within 10 to 20 million years, and you see all the different animal forms that still exist today. And they become extremely abundant, and the forms and shapes really explode. And that was because so, of eyeballs, or because of hard parts, or because of a mixture of things having eyeballs and then chasing partly, predator prey? And partly it's because these creatures only became visible in the fossil record at that point, because they developed an armor, developed spines and eyes, because organisms went into an arms race. They started to eat each other. If you are threatened to being eaten, you build an armor. But, an this, armor. Is already, but this is already when you have animals already. Right? That's right. The animals evolved earlier. So let me ask you a question. Based on what we know about the evolution of animals and, and fungi and plants, is it possible to imagine plant life on other planets evolving without evolving animals, without evolving things with central nervous systems, without evolving things with hard parts, and just being content with fungi and plant-like things? So the question is whether plants could have evolved without animals evolving. Yes. Well, of course, everything is interconnected in, in, in terrestrial life. What well, has so been, this of course. Is, uh, the, so this is impossible to answer without winding the tape back. Okay, wind the, tape back. wind the tape back. I think uh, plants, plants today would be pretty happy if there was no one chewing on their leaves. So I think they would do quite well. What I don't know, of course, is whether you need animals to prepare the soil where plants live in, for example. That's a good question. P uh, difficult to answer. Well, there were no animals on land. I mean, plants came on land earlier than animals did, right? I'm not so sure. There were probably Eurypterid-like organisms that, What's that? What's that crept on land very early. Um, you know, Pre-scorpions. Oh, Pre-scorpions. Um, you could imagine that animals crept on land from water to protect themselves against predators, even if there was nothing to eat okay. at that point. So what you're saying is that the biosphere on Earth is so, animals and plants and fungi are so interrelated that it's hard to ask this question whether, it's pretty difficult whether you could have a, a planet without animals. Uh, well, but one thing is very clear. Plants would look entirely and totally different without animals. How would they look? <laughs> Again, I can't answer <laughs> that. But lots of things, of course, all these things that plants have now to defend themselves against animals. Sting nettles would not sting, that's for sure. Uh, eucalypts would not smell of eucalypts because that's a deterrent against beetles and other insects eating them. So all of these things would be different. Huh, but you don't think it's impossible that, I mean, that you could have a planet without animals? They would be very happy, I'm pretty sure, as long as the soil will work. Soil, so, okay, so... Let me ask you then, uh, we have a billion planets out there, all of them have life. What fraction of them have what you would call the functional equivalent of animals? 0.032%. Oh, okay. <laughs> there you <laughs> heard it, 0.032%. That's great, egregious, misleading precision. <laughs> That's right. Uh, Eighty-nine point one point five percent of all of all statistics. So it's a difficult. So it's a difficult question. And you're not even, I mean, animals are what we are. And so it's an important question for us whether animals would exist. Because in movies, not only animals, but we're putting people essentially elsewhere. And, the, you know, large-brained aliens. And that's another question we'll get to later. But here, let's just talk about whether animals, I mean, I could ask, wait, how about a planet without opisticons, without fungi or animals and just plants. That's right. So if you would talk about opistocons living elsewhere in the universe, people would say, this is completely crazy. Or as you would say, would a sulfur-crested cockatoo exist on another planet? Totally crazy. 
animals are as crazy. Animals is something that a biologist would define as something that exists here on Earth. These things don't exist elsewhere, elsewhere unless someone took them there. Okay, let me stop you. Let me stop you. So it I'm would not be an animal. It would be the functional equivalent as an animal. Something that we humans look at and think, oh, it sort of looks like an animal. Well, wait a minute. Let me let me go back. There's a principle in biology that said, for example, how common are heads? Should we expect aliens to have heads? Now, if here's we have lots and lots of critters here with heads. But they have a common ancestor. Heads are monophyletic. So if we go back 800 million years, there's only one species that with a have. head. Absolutely. So a head is species specific, which is as crazy as looking for a sulfur crested cockatoo. So looking for heads among aliens is as crazy as looking for a sulfur crested cockatoo or an Indian elephant out in outer space. Now, no, now I wouldn't disagree well, wait, with that. Okay, disagree yeah. a little bit. But I can take that further. Any feature of life on Earth, if you go back far enough, will converge on a specific, very specific, you call it species specific, and that means any feature, like we talk about animals, one time there was only one species which evolved and radiated into all animals. Yes. So animals some... is a species specific characteristic which we should not expect elsewhere. That's, that's a very interesting thought and it's true, but some innovations within evolution uh, were so incredibly useful. Oh, 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 now you've hit a hard <laughs> one. So, uh, our, this is called, this is where our adaptations are better than other adaptations, and that's why we're inevitable discussion. You would, are you no, pleading no. guilty here? Pleading no, 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 no. I don't plead guilty of uh, anthropomorphism. Um, not everything in evolution that we humans still share must be not good because just because I'm it's not saying it's not good. I'm just not saying it's the best. Every every we're the best. Therefore, everything will become like us. This is like the the, the Planet of the Apes fallacy. Our adaptation. We live in the intelligence niche. Everything wants to be like us. Also, if you go far back, far back enough in animal evolution, where animals were experimenting with different uh, symmetries, bilateral symmetry, dorsal, ventral, a front, a back, or radial symmetry, or there was strange creatures like Tribachidium that had a triradiate symmetry or Eo Andromeda with an octahedral symmetry. Many of these have gone extinct, but quite clearly larger creatures that move have to choose a certain type of symmetry or asymmetry. Yeah, but wait, I'm, I'm calling into question the whole idea of larger creatures because all large creatures had a common ancestor. Therefore, I, large creatures are species specific. Not all, not not all large creatures had a common ancestor. Of course they all life false. on Earth has a common an a common ancestor. No, no, but I mean, you're misusing the terminology here. For example, plants and animals are in that sense independently large they're because they both large. have single celled ancestors. Yes, that, that means they had a common ancestor. I agree, common with ancestor. Your, I agree with your notion that they didn't become entirely independently multicellular because they had the same machinery that allowed of course, them to become of multicellular. Course. But the definition of the word independently multicellular means that the last common ancestor each was a single celled creature and they evolved into first two cells, four cells, and so on. Wait, stop, independently stop, stop. From each other. Here are plants, here are fungi, here are animals. If we trace them back, here are 1.2 billion, 1.6 billion. And right no, here, the, no, wait, no. right here, there's but a species that's going to go joop, 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 joop. Now, that right. species, going to look for that species. Is, analog is the same thing as going to look for sulfur-crested cockatoos. If that's a crazy idea, then looking for either plants, animals, or fungi is as crazy. Yes? No? No, it's, that, is, that is false. Because the further you go back in the tree, the creatures, the features become more simple. They're less entrenched. For example, if you, look at, well, if you look at the sulfur-crested cockatoo in comparison to the gala, one has a yellow crest, the other one has a pink crest. Yes, that's pretty idiosyncratic. And there's no reason why one or the other should suddenly explode and everything becomes yellow crested in a billion years' time. No, wait, everything. wait, wait. Entrenched. The word, you used the word entrenched. Yes. Now, you used the word entrenched because you know that the thing that I was talking about was a long time ago, and you knew about all the things that became of it. Here's a sulfur crested cockatoo today. You don't know no. about all of the things that it in the future will evolve into, and therefore you call it, uh, this, is this is entrenched and this is not entrenched because this has potential, no. this does not. That's no. completely anachronistic, no, makes that's, no that's, sense that's, at all. That is, that is absolutely not true. Entrenched is a biological, it's a genetic term that, you know, complex creatures like us are modular. We built 
more or less of cassettes that fit into each other. You can duplicate them and you can modify them. And then you can add another pair of arms and a pair of wings, maybe another pair of eyes somewhere. All you need to Genes do that do the is same thing. switching. Chromosomes That's can right. do the same thing. You just switch on some some. Life is always like that. Saying, Life is always like that. Here. That's right. So it is not only modular, but it's also hierarchical. So we Genes have a, like a set of switches that evolve in the beginning. And then there's a more complex set of switches sure, above sure. of that. And another set of switches You're above of that. The choir, and the yeah. lower ones are regulating the ones that have sure, evolved sure. later. Sure, sure. I agree with that. Making evolutionary changes at one of the switches that evolved very early becomes usually fatal because it changes too much and the creature okay. will not be able so to live. That is called entrenchment. <laughs> a silver crested cockatoo has huge amounts of entrenchment. You can change you're the color me of its crest, but you cannot add another pair of wings because so a cockatoo with four pairs of wings will not survive. I would say the answer and to so this is... And so the further you go back, <laughs> the more fundamental the evolution innovations are. And there's no. a much lower choice of different things these creatures could do in comparison to silver crested cockatoo. There were very basic questions like, am I radial symmetrical or bilateral symmetrical or octaradial symmetrical? The choices, they're much more limited than having... 50,000 different types of coloration on a bird. Well, I, I, su I suspect that what you're talking about is prejudice and bias. And that prejudice has to do what? with being alive today and not being alive two billion years ago when we had the common ancestor of all fungi, animals, and plants. Because you're saying back then, compared to the hierarchical level we have today in a sulfur crested cockatoo, the hierarchy here was depauperated. It was smaller. It was uh, not as many levels. And therefore, it wasn't as entrenched. But compared to what will be in a billion years, there'll be even more entrenchment and more, uh, I guess, quirkiness up here. Now, it certainly is the case that as things get uh, diverged, you get more quirkiness. But what we're trying to understand is, how quirky was this thing? And you're saying, oh, not, that's not as quirky because it wasn't as entrenched, because it, didn't, it had more possibilities. But you only know about those possibilities because we're later I think, here. I think you, 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 you put it quite right, and you actually made my case. If you go back in the very beginning of a small single-celled organisms, when the first cells formed, there was probably pre-cellular chemistry as well that might have been life. Um, what sort of shapes and forms can you have? You can be a little cocos, you can be a little... little a ball, you can be maybe a little rot or maybe a tiny little spiral. The number of different possibilities, how you build a cell or how can you build one biological unit is very limited. And well, so you can expect with a much higher probability that an early organism on a different planet looks like a coccus much more than you can expect it looks two billion years later like a sulfur crested cockatoo. There's huge differences in the probability to find the one or the other. I think if I could replace you with Lynn Margulis, who loves single-celled eukaryotes, she would disagree very strongly with the idea that the common ancestor of plants, fungi, and animals was somehow less entrenched because it had so many details that you and I are not aware of. And it those was had way, long way, history. way less entrenched. Look, look, oh, look it, oh. could, it could evolve into animals, plants, fungi, plus a thousand different well, look things at the thing that the didn't evolve. The sulfur-crested cockatoo will evolve no, into no, no, one, no. two, three, the four in the future. The sulfur-crested cockatoo in the first instance, no, for I'm example, in the future, is heterotrophic. In the future. In the future, it's not going to become a phototroph. It's not going to live off the sunlight <laughs> because that is entrenched. It's not going to become a know, plant, Charlie. Yeah, I know but the last common ancestor of plants and animals could become heterotroph with teeth or without teeth. It could be a scavenger. It could be a predator. But, it could become a phototroph doing photosynthesis. But notice that the variety... Amazing. The Notice that the variety that you're using of something here could become is defined by the variety that we have in life today. And that variety did not exist down here. There was other types of variety. In the future, there'll be even a larger type of variety. And therefore, we will say, oh, the, super, the sulfur crested cockatoo, we didn't even know about, blah, blah, blah. But we will have that there if, if life keeps on diverging. Charlie, and so this is a, an anachronistic discussion we're having. You, you're mixing up some concepts here. Mm. Diversity and disparity. The, the last common ancestors of all eukaryotes um, had a huge potential for different disparity. It had the ability to take on different Wait, metabolisms. Say those, say those words it again, had disparity, disparity and diversity. And diversity. You, you, uh, for example, I you, might, you might have a meadow. Uh, you're, you're an entomologist. You go on the meadow and you count the different types of beetle. You might find 1,000 different types, species of beetle. Yes. But they're all relatively similar, and they do relatively similar things. They might eat different types of plants, but more or less that's it, different sizes, So the number colors. of species is what? That's the diversity. And the number but, but of diversity. If you, but I mean. if you have maybe another ecosystem, somewhere maybe a little, little quarkonite 
ice cold pond somewhere in the Antarctic with a little bit of meltwater. You might find only 10 species in it, but with a huge, huge disparity because one of them might be a cyanobacterium doing photosynthesis, then there might be an anoxygenic phototrophic organisms living in an anoxic layer underneath. You might have organisms oxidizing iron and reducing okay, so sulfur. That is disparity. And there's so this, what were the two words again? D variety? This disparity. The, doing the, the other word, the other word. Diversity. Diversity. So what you're saying is diversity, you can have a lot of different species that are very close related, and disparity is when you have the same number of species or fewer that are more widely separated genetically. That's what uh, you're saying. And, and also by metabolism, by the fundamental chemical ways of life. Okay. If, you, if you, you talk about this huge variety of different things that could come from the sulfur crested cockatoo, but alas, they're all going to be heterotrophs. None of them is going to oxidize iron or reduce sulfate. None of them will, Maybe, because their genome oh, is too no. entrenched. No, they would have to remove all those layers, go back to the basic, Haven't and restructure the entire creature to yeah, become a sulfate yeah, reducer. Yeah. Haven't you ever heard of endosymbiosis? What's wrong with you? Well, that's a totally different number of things. <laughs> that changes that changes the game <laughs> altogether. Does, of course it does. Life has a way of doing that. But no way of knowing that anything like that could happen on a different planet, Charlie. No way of knowing? No. You've been arguing... Wait a minute. I've been arguing that this common ancestor of multicellular creatures is as quirky as a species, and therefore you should not expect it elsewhere. You're arguing that uh, you should expect it elsewhere, I thought. <laughs> no, what, what I tell you is... The, the further you go back in evolution, yes. the less entrenchment you have, the less complicated different levels of evolutionary complexity have evolved on top of basic features, the more likely you find something that is similar on a different planet. Now, I would agree with you if you wanted to go all the way back to the biochemistry, because that's, that's the exact argument I use to say, hey, the biochemistry on our planet is like the biochemistry elsewhere, and therefore you should, right. should expect the beginnings so of life to be similar. Start, start with a different... All life needs matter and all life needs energy. Yeah, has we to have work no problem against entropy. No problem so, with that. So maybe other planets have totally different sources, like for a carbon planet. No. Might have completely well, different yes, sources yes. of energy. Yes. Um, although most planets, I assume, will have photons as energy. Yes, yes, and redox gradients, the same as pretty much but, the same as we have here. It, you know, if, if organisms start using completely different types of energy, if you have organisms, for example, using radioactivity, hmm. you might have really an unimaginably completely different type of life. 